So, hello. Uh, I would like first to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work uh, in the selection process for uh, the specific position at the uh, National Technical University of Athens. Uh, so, in an attempt uh, to give a more complete picture uh, of my work, uh, of my current research activity, I will present two lines of research. One is about uh, the thermodynamics of black holes in the superpotential formalism. And it is in uh, it is work uh, with Ioannis Papadimitriou from the National Kapodistrian University of Athens. And the second is uh, about uh, black hole classification and uh, possible uniqueness theorems in this context uh, in collaboration with James Lucietti uh, and the Sergei Ovchinico from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, about the title, uh, Supersymmetric Black Holes in ADS, I used it as an umbrella term um, to describe both these uh, research uh, lines. So, the main motivation uh, for uh, this kind of projects uh, comes from holography, uh, where you know that uh, microstates and the dual field theory should correspond uh, to black holes, um, to, the, to, the, to the entropy of black holes, uh, should account for the entropy of black holes in ADS. Um, and uh, this problem uh, for ADS3 is uh, kind of more tractable to do the Carty formula. Uh, however, it turns out that in higher dimensions is much harder. Uh, however, uh, in the recent years there has been enormous progress on the field theory side through the technique of supersymmetric localization which allows for uh, the enumeration of BPS microstates. Uh, and uh, I would like to see what is this corresponding uh, picture in the bulk um, where there are, I will have divided in uh, the main approaches in two uh, broad categories, uh, the ones concern uh, working on this problem uh, without having the explicit solution uh, at hand. So this is in the spirit of uh, sense entropy functions uh, and also I will describe in this talk the superpotential approach. Um, and there are others as well. And the second main category uh, concerns uh, constructing explicitly the solution, classifying them and then computing the entropy uh, through just computing the horizon area. So a few words about black holes in ADS-5. Those are solutions uh, of type 2b supergravity with ADS-5 causes 5 asymptotics. Uh, and these we know they are dual 20 equals 4 super young males which is a uh, 4D gauge theory, conformal, uh, super conformal field theory, uh, with gauge group SUN. Uh, in the bulk, the black hole entropy uh, should scale as 1 over Newton's constant, uh, which from the holographic dictionary we know that it's uh, proportional to the square of the number of colors uh, in the gauge theory. The known black holes uh, uh, in this class uh, are characterized by six conserved charges. So, of course, we have a mass uh, corresponding to the fact that we are working with stationary solutions. We have two angular momenta corresponding to the two independent rotation planes uh, on ADS-5 and three electric charges which correspond uh, to the cartan of SO6 that rotates the 5-sphere. There are important solutions in this class uh, in various truncations and this includes, for example, the Kerry DS5 or Hunter-Taylor uh, solution, uh, which is a solution in pure Einstein gravity with a negative cosmological constant. And of course, there is the charge generalization of this in minimal gauge supergravity, actually, uh, which is known uh, as CCLP solutions from the names of the authors, of the, of the people who first found it. Uh, the simplest occasion in, where, in which all the three gauge fields are retained is the so-called SDU model, uh, and I will talk a bit, uh, a bit more about it later. Uh, and this is uh, an N equals 2 theory, so it has uh, supersymmetry, uh, and of course BPS solutions, uh, which are characterized, uh, as is well known, by the BPS relation among the charges, which relates the energy to the sum of the other charges. But something that is not so well known is the fact that there is another constraint, uh, non-linear among the charges in these solutions. So from the six parameter family which uh, have the non-extremal black holes, these BPS ones have, uh, is a four parameter family. Uh, an important fact is that in five dimensions this must be both rotating and charged. 
So if we want to study the simplest possible example, you, could, you cannot uh, just turn off rotation uh, or, uh, or charge. Um, but there is a simpler, uh, let's say, solution, a simpler class of solutions in, uh, within this class. And these are the ones that they have, they are rotating, but their two angular momenta are equal. And they have some enhanced symmetry uh, as you do cross U1. This is a three parameter family of solutions. Um, okay, so what are the main questions we wanted to understand uh, in, and we initiated these projects? So in the first line of research, uh, the main motivation came from field theory actually, uh, where there is, uh, where the BPS entropy, uh, the, B, the, B, the entropy of BPS black holes is uh, usually reproduced by the extremization uh, of a functional which is related to the index in the field theory. And we want to understand this extremization principle uh, in the bulk, uh, actually, in some sense, which is the space of solutions over which we extremize. And we want to do that off-shell without uh, resorting to explicit solutions uh, where the regularity of, on the horizon is typically built in. Uh, that is for BPS black holes. There is another extremization principle, sense extremization, which is about uh, extremal black holes. Uh, we want to understand what is the relation between the two extremization principles. It turns out that a very uh, a powerful uh, method and a very good formalism to study to make this investigation is the effective spirit potential, which I will describe uh, in a few moments. On the other lines of research, uh, the main motivation was that Okay, we know the most general uh, known solution. Uh, we know, know that there is a very general class of solutions which all have spherical horizons in this five. Uh, are there other solutions, perhaps with different topologies? Um, and uh, if no, can we prove any uniqueness theorem in that case? Uh, so the plan of my talk is as follows. Uh, on the first, uh, it is divided in two parts. Uh, in two parts. Uh, in the first part. I will talk about uh, the superpotential approach uh, and I will start by explaining the general formalism. Uh, I will be rather schematic here in order to be more general uh, for every dimension and then later I will focus uh, on uh, the BPS case. On the other side, uh, on, the other, on the other line of research, um, we will see that uh, the problem of classification actually reduces uh, to a problem in toric color geometry. And I will also present uh, some of the first uniqueness theorems uh, for BPS black holes in ADS. So let me start with the first part. Uh, so uh, the, the part we can apply this uh, superpotential formalism when uh, we have super structures of supergravity, which actu where actually the dynamics is effectively one dimensional in terms of some radial coordinate r. From now on, I will denote with a dot uh, derivatives with respect to r. Uh, so a typical Lansard in that case has this uh, schematic, let's say, form where the blue functions depend uh, are functions only of the radial coordinate, uh, and we see here this thing which multiplies the r squared, called, usually called the lapse functions. We have this variable u which corresponds to some effective size of the transverse sphere, um, some radial dependent angular velocity. So the typical example uh, of such solutions are of course the static uh, black holes. Uh, but these answers can also describe rotating ones, which, however, in order for the problem to be to have effectively one uh, dimensional dynamics, they need to have some enhanced symmetry. Uh, a typical example in that case is the SU2 cross U1 sector of the five dimensional STU model. So one starts by taking uh, his or her favorite supergravity action and reduce it, reducing it in the RT plane uh, and up to boundary terms. Uh, these uh, theories described by a typical Lagrangian, uh, one-dimensional Lagrangian, uh, where I want to point out here how the lapse function enters, uh, in particular in the enters without derivatives, which means that it's a non-dynamical field, which physically reflects the fact that uh, our theory is invariant under reparameterization so far. And uh, we know that in such cases, or we can easily show by the Hamiltonian, uh, that uh, uh, the Hamiltonian should vanish. Uh, which is this condition here in terms of the moment and the fields. Now, 
The effective superpotential formalism actually uh, is based on the Hamilton-Jacobi uh, framework, uh, where one writes the momentum, uh, the momenta as gradients of a function, the Hamilton-Jacobi function, uh, and only of those, not uh, of anything else. So the two, the um, the second order equations of motion are now equivalent to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation which is just the vanishing of the Hamilton in our case, and it's a PD, and some first order flow equations, which is, which is nothing more than the definition of the momentum. The twin to n integration constants coming from the second order equations of motion actually split in n, in n that come uh, from the solution of the hamilton jacobi equation and another n which come uh, from the solution of the flow equations and this split is very natural from a holographic perspective since um, uh, uh, the former just correspond to normalizable modes or VEVs in the field theory while the, uh, the other ha while the latter uh, correspond to non-normalizable modes or sources in the field theory so now uh, the, we can actually exploit the symmetries uh, of, uh, of the problem at hand to write an, a simplified form for the, for the effect for the Hamilton-Jacobi function. So you see that from time rescalings, actually the blackening factor here uh, just uh, appears linearly in the Hamilton-Jacobi uh, function. Uh, the same holds for uh, the angular velocity, let's say, or the, and the electric component of the gauge field, which multiply their corresponding uh, conserved charges. The part of the Hamilton-Jacobi function that describes the non-trivial dynamics is what we call actually the effective superpotential in this talk. So if I'm given an effective superpotential, in principle, I can plug this in the flow equations and get the solution. Uh, an example. The simplest example is one uh, that only the uh, uh, effective size of the transverse sphere and uh, the electric component of the gauge field are non-trivial. In that case, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation reduces to an ordinary differential equation, which we can easily solve, and this is the solution. And in that case, this is nothing more than the superpotential for the rise and non from uh, ADS black hole. Um, a perhaps less trivial example is the superpotential for uh, the near region geometry of extremal black holes. So in that case, based on the enhanced symmetry of the near region geometry, which is uh, topologically ADS2 times a sphere, uh, we can write a generic form for the solution, which depends on, uh, like this, which depends only on some constants. In order to find these constants, we have to plug the solution inside the equations of motion. Now, the spirit of sense uh, extremization is that actually these equations of motion in terms of the, of the constant can be reformulated in terms of some uh, of the extremization of some entropy function. Uh, this is sense entropy function, which is nothing more than the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian integrated over uh, the transverse sphere, uh, and which is an easy integration since the solution is kind of trivial. Um, so, if we compute that functional, we can extremize it with respect to the constants, to find those constants. And uh, at the extreme, this gives us uh, the entropy of the extremal black hole. Um, in fact, the sense entropy function is related to the superpotential with this generic relation. So, it's, uh, so if I'm given uh, the uh, sense entropy function, which I can compute through the algorithm I just mentioned, uh, I can uh, also compute the superpotential for the black holes. Uh, actually, even for non-extremal black holes, we can formulate uh, an extremization principle. So, if I take uh, the flow equations and expand them near a smooth horizon, we actually can find the near horizon behavior of the superpotential. And it turns out that the superpotential should vanish on the horizon and should be extremized with respect to uh, every field except perhaps the size of the transverse sphere. In which case, the relevant derivative just gives us the product of the temperature times the entropy. I stress that this is an extremization principle, even for non quite generic, even for non-extremal black holes. In the extremal limit, it just reduces to sense extremization. 
Uh, also, uh, generic thermodynamic relations can be derived uh, straightforwardly from the uh, from in the superpotential formalism without having uh, the explicit solution on hand at all, or even a specific superpotential. Uh, the holographic charges uh, coincide uh, with the constants that appear in the one-dimensional radial formalism. Uh, the holographic mass is also related to the asymptotic value of the effective superpotential. And uh, one can easily demonstrate the, the quantum statistical relation, which relates the on-shell uh, renormalized uh, Euclidean action with uh, the Gibbs free energy. And also this leads to very elegantly to a derivation of the first law of black hole thermodynamics. So all these were quite generic, uh, I mean, uh, not, not necessarily for supersymmetric, uh, but I mean, it's hard in general to solve, besides some special cases, the uh, Hamilton-Jacobi uh, equation. After all, it's a PD, a nonlinear PD. But when supersymmetry is present, actually there is a trick. And the key observation uh, is that uh, the killing spinner equations in that case actually contain only first derivatives of uh, the fields. Uh, so it reminds, us, it reminds us of the flow equation. And actually, by playing with projections related to how much persimmetry one uh, is preserved, there is a, a combination of the killing smith equations which has this form here. So uh, it, it contains the derivative uh, of the transverse size, uh, of the size of the transverse sphere. Uh, and if we forget about the moment, uh, um, if we get for the moment for the killing spinner, we see that this has exactly the form of a flow equation uh, uh, of this one. So one can actually identify the right hand side of the relevant combination of killing spinner equations with the supersymmetric superpotential. We can plug this in in the Hamilton Jacob equation, we see that it's, that it's satisfied, so we have a valid solution uh, of the a valid superpotential. Note that this analysis is completely local, we just used the killing spinner equation, so we didn't assume any horizon. So this can describe black holes, both regular and irregular, but also even supersymmetric uh, solitons. So let me now apply, let us now apply this to uh, the specific uh, context, in, uh, the specific framework we are interested in, which is the five dimensional STU model. This is uh, n equals to Fagetti-Leopoulos gauge supergraphic, which besides the gravitational multiplets, multi multiplets, it also has two vector multiplets. And it's convenient to pack the two independent scalars uh, in the vector multiplets in three scalars, which, however, should satisfy a constraint. We are uh, interested in the SU2 cross 1 sector, where the dynamics again is uh, one dimensional uh, and effectively one dimensional. And we see that, in that and uh, the answer for describing those uh, is given by this form here. Uh, now, the best way to present the superpotential is if you combine the magnetic uh, part of the gauge field, let's say, with the scalars in some complex combinations, as here. Uh, so, in that case, the BPS potential can be written quite easily and uh, very elegantly as just the modulus of a, super, of a, a holomorphic superpotential, which is holomorphic with respect to these variables VI and has this simple cubic form. Uh, this is actually the first example of a rotating, uh, of a superpotential for rotating black holes. Uh, there has been for a long time known the superpotential, the Dalagatanyet U1, uh, which describes, the, however, only static black holes and in four dimensions. Uh, actually, uh, let's move now to the thermodynamics. Actually, supersymmetry constrains strongly the thermodynamics. In our superpotential formulas, we can easily show that the BPS, that the chemical potentials are frozen to some fixed values, their BPS values. Uh, which have some specific form, uh, which depends on the uh, boundary data. Uh, and, from, uh, and also we can compute uh, the holographic charges from the, super, from the superpotential by computing the one-point function and then integrating uh, on the boundary. And one can show that um, uh, these satisfy the BPS relation here. Uh, and this is consistent with a field theory analysis uh, uh, from the anomalous super, uh, transformation of the supercurrent. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the BPS superpotential actually describes 
all uh, specimetrics, all uh, one fourth specimetric solution, even the one the ones that are pathological. To obtain the regular ones, we actually need to impose the extremization conditions uh, that I mentioned earlier, which for BP for the BPH super potential are actually equivalent to the vanishing of uh, and the extremization of the holomorphic superpotential. Now, these are algebraic equations in terms of the fields on the horizon. Uh, and uh, they, they can be used to determine completely the uh, near horizon data in terms of the charges. Uh, this is actually a manifestation of the attractor mechanism in five dimensions. And using this near horizon data, one can show, can also compute the entropy of the black holes. Uh, moreover, after a careful uh, analysis, one sees that there are more equations in this system than are known. So, in fact, there is a constraint amo among the parameters of the superpotential, which are the charges, actually. And this constraint looks like this. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, the only constraint that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, that uh, known black holes satisfy. But note that here we have derived that uh, without any reference to the explicit uh, black hole solution. Now, there is a complication uh, uh, concerning the Onsell action of BPS black holes. So, these are extremal, they have zero temperature, and if we want to compute the Onsell action from the quantum statistical relation, well, here, since they are uh, extremal, we have a 1 over 0 here, and from the BPS relation, that also holds for um, supersymmetric black holes, we also have time 0 here. So, it's a complicated limit, uh, and it has been long explored uh, uh, in the literature. It turns out that the right way, I mean the way to reproduce the field theory results, is to consider uh, complex BPS adels. So actually in this uh, uh, figure here, it means that we should move along the vertical line in order to reach the real BPS locus. So in our formalism, this means actually that now Instead of using the VI, we should consider we should complexify first of all our fields, and we should consider uh, independent VI plus and VI minus given by these combinations, which are now not complex conjugate to each other. Formally, the superpotential is takes the same form, but now Z plus and Z minus are, are independent, actually. They are not complex conjugate to each other. And only one of those should vanish on the horizon, which leads to a slower blackening behavior, so and to a non-zero temperature actually, although the temperature is complex. So since Z plus and Z minus are independent, actually only one of the extremization conditions is imposed, and only one we take that as the plus one uh, of the VIs is determined through the, um, the near horizon analysis. So this this extra freedom we have actually. Uh, um, leads to a deviation of the of the chemical potential from the real from the real BPS values linear in the temperature. Uh, we can think of that uh, even the temperature, since the temperature is complex, uh, it's also unfrozen from its vanishing value in the real case. So these uh, deviations, uh, these departures, are parameterized by this quantity delta here, uh, which sometimes people call uh, BPS uh, chemical potentials. And those should satisfy this uh, simple constraint. The BPS relation also is modified linearly in the complex temperature in the following form. And now one can easily take the extremal limit in the quantum statistical relation and compute the BPS uh, on cell action, which has this form here. And in particular for uh, backgrounds that asymptote global ADS, uh, this the second term vanishes, so we have just this term here. And now let me come back to the original motivation we had to start this problem. Uh, and the point is that uh, the superpotential actually defines, the BPS superpotential defines an entropy function for BPS black holes in the bulk. Uh, and this is very similar to SENS. So one can notice that the entropy function is related to the superpotential in a sen like uh, way. And if we express this entropy function in terms of the BPS chemical potential, it takes this form here where I would like to pause for a second and uh, see a few things here. So here we notice that U as appears here just acts as a Lagrange multiplier that imposes the constraint. And upon this constraint, actually, we should extremize the entropy function in terms of the deltas. 
And what we really extremize is the Legendre transform of uh, this quantity here. Um, uh, and at the extremum, it gives us the entropy. But this is exactly, this Legendre transform of this quantity is exactly what appears in the field theory and uh, what was proposed by Hossein, Christophe and Zaffaroni uh, to, uh, as the quantity that should count, the extremization of which gives us the black hole entropy in uh, field theory. Uh, so we see that our superpotential, the, the generic superpotential extremization we propose actually has a special case for complex BPS saddle, the uh, superpotential uh, the extremization of, of HAG, which is the relevant one for in the field theory. <coughs> so I hope I can convince you that the effective, the effective superpotential uh, approach is a powerful method to uh, study the black hole, the, the thermodynamics of black holes when there is a quite large amount of symmetry. And actually, it serves also as a unifying entropy function. So, in special limits, it gives various extremization principles that appear in the literature. Now, let me switch gears a bit and uh, talk about the, the other line of research, the classification of black hole solutions. So, as a short motivation, okay, so the superpotential approach is quite elegant uh, to study black hole thermodynamics, but it's not constructive in principle. It doesn't give us immediately solutions. However, having explicit solutions and classify them is important in holography uh, because we have uh, a complete control of the holographic RG flow and moreover because uh, if we have two different solutions asymptotic charges, we can distinguish between those. However, in contrast to flat space where one has no hair theorems or uniqueness theorems, the classification problem in media is, is notoriously hard. Uh, uh, there are not any results known. Uh, but we would expect that when supersymmetry is present, the problem can, is more tractable. So let's start for, with the simplest possible setup, which is the minimal uh, gauge supergravity fine dimensions, uh, and in, in which case we have just the graviton and the gauge field. And it turns out uh, that all the solution is actually determined by uh, the data on a four-dimensional color manifold. Uh, in particular, uh, this omega is determined through data on the color manifold by an equation of the form d omega uh, equals something that is contains curvature or curvatures on the color manifold. Uh, but it turns out that the integrability condition for this equation is not uh, is not trivial. Uh, so this means that actually uh, the color manifold is not free to choose. Uh, it has to be an equation, uh, which is actually this equation here, which is fourth order for its curvatures, for, for the curvature on the color manifold. Okay, we know uh, so the, uh, there is a solution, the most general known solution, which is the CCLP one, the supersymmetric CCLP one, and which has this form here. Uh, to this equation. It depends only on two parameters. Of course, besides this solution, which is supersymmetric, also the near horizon geometry should be uh, solution should be supersymmetric, which is, has the same form as the CCLP, but without these blue terms. The horizon of this CCLP, solu of the CCLP solution has spherical topology. So a natural question is, can we find other solutions with different topologies? Just for comparison, in the engaged theory, uh, this problem has been completely solved for, uh, with the assumption of axial symmetry or toric symmetry. And there is a rich moduli space uh, of solutions with different topologies, black, black rings, black lenses, etc. Um, so let's start also here uh, with, a, with toric symmetry. In that case, uh, the generators of the toric symmetry actually define some moment maps for the Kähler structure. And these moment maps, together with the angles that are adapted to the toric symmetry, define a set of symplectic coordinates. In which case, the Keller, the Keller uh, metric gets this simple uh, block diagonal form. Now, in physics, we mostly use the Keller potential to describe uh, color manifolds. Uh, but I mean, it turns out that for these problems, for this kind of problem, the symplectic potential, which is related to the Keller potential, is the most convenient tool. Again, the split potential uh, with differentiated twice, it gives us components of the metric. 
Uh, and if you plug that in the integrability condition I mentioned earlier, uh, this, it turns out that this needs to satisfy the highly complicated 8th order uh, partial differential equation. So, and this equation should be solved on the orbit space. Uh, so, uh, the part that has non-trivial metric, let's say, uh, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the manifold, of, of the five dimensions. Um, and uh, this orbit space turns out that it should be a manifold with boundary, uh, with boundaries and corners. Uh, the boundary segments correspond to axis components where one combination of the killing fields generating the torus symmetry should vanish and the corners correspond to either uh, fixed points of the torus symmetry, so where both vanish, both vector killing fields vanish, or to horizons. The fixed points are usually denoted by black dots and uh, the horizon with white dots is just a convention. Uh, by performing some smoothness analysis, we managed to find uh, the boundary conditions uh, that uh, the, the symplectic potential should satisfy on every component on the boundary. So, now we have a well-posed problem, actually, in principle, but still we need to solve the 8th order partial differential equation. Uh, I'm sorry for the avalanche. <laughs> uh, uh, so, this is very hard and we needed to uh, resort to some special class but quite generic of uh, colored bases and these are the ones are the, those of calabi type uh, so this is a metric for a calabi type color metric uh, and it's characterized by two functions of a single variable f and g it turns out that g can be completely determined from the nearest geometry and uh, rho equals zero corresponds to the horizon so we were able to prove a uniqueness theorem in that case, namely that any supersymmetric torus solution that is time-like outside a smooth, specially compact horizon uh, with a base of calabic type must be either the supersymmetric uh, CCLP solution or its near horizon geometry. Uh, in particular, and perhaps somewhat surprisingly, we didn't assume anything on the asymptotics here. So this excludes asymptotically logical so, uh, ADA solutions, at least within the Calabi class. And of course, the Calabi class includes uh, SQ2 invariant uh, solutions, which was a theorem that appeared a little bit earlier uh, before the one for Calabi type. Um, so the key points in this second line of research uh, that I wanted to convey was that um, the symplectic formal is with the symplectic potential is ideal to describe the structure of the orbit space for ADS5, for specific ADS5 black holes, and that we managed to prove some uniqueness uh, theorem. Uh, and in, as a corollary, we found that there are no asymptotic local ADS5 solutions, at least within the Calabi class. Uh, in a paper that we will hope to publish quite soon, uh, we managed to prove a stronger version of, the, of this uniqueness theorem, where uh, we, have, we have weakened a bit uh, the Calabi assumption, and we managed to generalize this uh, theorem for multi-charged black holes in the STU model. Of course, uh, there are many open problems in both uh, lines of research that, one, that is worth pursuing. Uh, I'm particularly interested at the moment uh, at this one, which is just applying the superpotential approach to the STU model, but augmented with Harper multiplets. So this approach is currently working with George Itzios. And I would like also to know the answer uh, to the question if there are uniqueness theorems in ADS4 black holes, where uh, our techniques are, do not apply uh, directly. Uh, and of course, another intriguing uh, question is related to the fact that there are entropy functions that are formulated in higher dimensions. Uh, so we would like, I would like to know uh, if those are related in some way to the superpotential approach. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs>